The date was April 18, 1943, when four teenage boys, Thomas Willits, Robert Hart, Bob Farmer, and Fred Payne, decided to go looking for bird's eggs in Hagley Wood. The woods were a part of the Hagley estate belonging to Lord Cobham. They knew that if they were caught, they could face consequences for trespassing on private property. But no young man can resist the call of adventure. Little did they know that their afternoon escapade would lead to the shock of a lifetime. The boys walked until they came upon a large witch elm. They believed they had struck gold. A tree this grand surely had a bird's nest in it. Farmer, being the smallest of the boys, eagerly climbed up to check. As he peered down inside the hollow trunk, something caught his attention, but it wasn't a nest of eggs. It was a skull. Initially, they figured it was an animal skull. They pulled it out to examine their discovery and were hit with a grotesque realization. The skull had human hair and teeth. The boys quickly shoved it back into the tree and fled the woods in terror, promising never to speak of the incident again. Of course, the vow of silence didn't last long. Tom Willits was racked by guilt and confessed to his father. His parents then contacted the police, who rushed out to investigate. They opened up the tree to get a better look and were stunned to find that there was an entire skeleton hidden within the trunk. They also found a gold ring, a shoe, and some clothing scraps inside. The skeleton was mostly intact, save for one hand and a few missing teeth. The bones of the hand were soon located laying around the tree. The body was subjected to a thorough forensic exam by Professor James Webster. Webster gathered that the remains belonged to a 35-year-old woman who was approximately 5 feet tall with crooked teeth, and that she had given birth to at least one child during her lifetime. He also noted that a piece of taffeta had been jammed into her throat, which likely caused her to suffocate. Webster was adamant that the woman's body would have to have been placed in the tree before or shortly after death as it would be an impossible act after rigor mortis set in. He took note of the level of decay and concluded that the body had been in the tree for about a year and a half. With all of that in mind, the authorities attempted to put a name to the victim. They went through missing persons files and dental records, but it was World War II and many, many people were being reported missing. They even tried sourcing the woman's shoes. While they were able to track down the maker and most of the women who had purchased the shoes, they were no closer to finding the identity of the body. With no other leads to pursue, the police abandoned the case. It seemed as if the woman's story would forever be lost in time. But then the Christmas of 1943 brought with it a mysterious gift. On the side of an empty house in Old Hill, graffiti appeared that read, Who put Labella down the witch elm? Then another version appeared on a wall in Upper Dean Street, Birmingham. This one read, who put Bella down the witch elm, Hagley Wood? It wasn't long before these messages were popping up all over the area. While the graffiti failed to be much help to investigators, it did make one thing perfectly clear. Someone, somewhere, cared about this missing woman. And they were demanding answers. Sadly, those answers would never be found. And to this day, Bella's identity remains unknown. But her legend has lived on. Beginning in the 70s, the Bella Graffiti began appearing on the Witchberry Obelisk. There have also been numerous theories about the mystery over the years, some more credible than others. In 1945, anthropologist and archaeologist Margaret Murray proposed that Bella had been the victim of an occult ritual known as the Hand of Glory. The Hand of Glory involves amputating a criminal's hand and preserving it in order to obtain supernatural powers. Often the hand would be made into a candle. Now this theory may sound insane, but police did give it proper consideration. Hagley Wood had long been rumored to be a popular meeting spot for covens, so perhaps it wasn't out of the realm of possibility. It wasn't the only English murder around that time that was linked to witchcraft either. In 1945, Charles Walton of Warwickshire was found dead with his neck pinned to the ground by his own pitchfork, prompting whispers of black magic. But speculation and murmurs of witchcraft don't amount to solid evidence, and eventually Murray's claim was disregarded entirely. 
The next lead came in 1953 when Lieutenant Colonel Wilfred Byford Jones, who wrote under the name of Quester for the Wolverhampton Express and Star, received a letter. The letter read in part, Finish your articles regarding the Witch Elm crime by all means. They are interesting to the readers, but you'll never solve the mystery. One person who could give the answers is now beyond the jurisdiction of earthly courts. Much as I hate having to use a nom de plume, I think you would appreciate it if you knew me. The only clues that I can give you are that the person responsible for the crime died insane in 1942, and the victim was Dutch and alive illegally in England about 1941. I have no wish to recall any more. Anna from Claverly. The paper forwarded Anna's letter to the police, who pleaded for her to come forward with her story. She sent another letter to Quester, writing, Dear Quester, Had so much publicity not been given to Anna, I would have contacted you before. I will meet you and the officers of the Worcestershire Criminal Investigation Department at the Dick Whittington. It is beyond the stew pony from Wolverhampton, tomorrow night at about 8.30 p.m., and maybe I can help them with their investigations if they are still interested, subject to my conditions to which I think they will agree. You, of course, will not advertise this meeting in your press. You have had many wild goose chases during the last few days. Maybe this will be the last or the beginning of many. Who knows? At the Whittington, they have a bar on the left of the entrance called the Priest's Hole. Sincerely, Anna. There is no official record of the meeting that transpired, and for a long time, Quester was not at liberty to speak. But in 1958, after learning that the identity of Anna had been revealed, he finally published his version of events. In his article, Quester states that Anna was really a woman named Una Hainsworth. She told the police that she had been approached by an officer in the Royal Air Force. He confessed that he had been involved with a murder. He had been driving with a friend who was a male trapeze artist. They were accompanied by a Dutchman and Bella who was also Dutch. The officer explained that his three passengers were actually German spies, tasked with gathering information on munitions factories in the Midlands. Apparently Bella had learned too much, and during the drive she was murdered by the trapeze artist and the Dutchman. The officer was then forced to drive to Hagley Wood, where the three of them placed the body into the tree. Una claimed that the weight of the secret became too much for the officer to bear. He suffered a mental breakdown and wound up in an institution. He remained there until his death. If this story sounds too out there, it's probably because it was. Una's police statement differs so radically from Quester's account that one has to wonder if his article was nothing more than a work of fiction, though the two versions do share some overlapping details. In her official statement, Una recalls that her former husband Jack Mossop was acquainted with Bella and a Dutchman named Van Ralt. She had a sneaking suspicion that Van Ralt may have been a spy, and that Jack may also have been involved in some shady activity. Jack confessed to her that the three of them had been drinking one night when Bella passed out drunk. The two of them decided to put her inside the tree in Hagley Wood as a prank. Una eventually left her husband, but when she met up with him again, she noticed that he was different from the man she had known before. His behavior was erratic and he kept mumbling about a woman glaring at him from the trees. She later went on to learn that he had been taken to a mental hospital, where he died in 1942. This story is almost as difficult to believe as Quester's. Una explained that she did not come forward until 1953 because that was when she had learned of the discovery of the body. But this was a highly publicized event. How could it have taken her almost a decade to hear about it? And why was there no mention of the fabric stuffed in her mouth? It is true that a man died in an institution at the place and date Una had provided, but that doesn't prove much. Also, why all the melodrama of the poetic letters and the cloak and dagger meeting with the police? When all the pieces are put together, it becomes clear that Una's tale doesn't really add up. Now we have to look at yet another spy theory. In 1941, the year of Bella's death, Gestapo agent Joseph Jacobs was arrested after parachuting into Cambridgeshire. He would go on to be known as the last person executed at the Tower of London. Upon his capture, he had with him a photo of his girlfriend, German actress Clara Bowerle. Jacobs claimed that Bowerle was also a spy, and that she was supposed to join him in England. 
She was 35 years old and spoke English well. She had also previously worked in the Midlands. Theorists have also noted that Clara Bowerley's name sounded remarkably similar to Clara Bella, which could have been shortened to simply Bella. She was the right age and had almost the right name, but Bowerley was six feet tall, making it nearly impossible for her to be the body in the tree. In 2016, the legend was debunked entirely when it was discovered that Clara Bowerley had died in Berlin in 1942. This last theory may be the most plausible. In 2014, it was suggested that Bella may have been a prostitute or a gypsy that worked near Hagley Wood. She was believed to have disappeared in 1941. So the dates match up. People slip through the cracks of society all the time. Was it possible that Bella was one of these people? Just another lonely soul with no loved ones to miss her? There are variations of this story. One claims that she had been killed by an American soldier after becoming pregnant with his child. Another claims she hid in a tree during a German air raid, though the latter seems highly unlikely. Perhaps we will never know the true identity of the woman in the witch elm, but there is still a lot of interest in her case, so it's possible that someday someone will find an answer. Bella may be long gone, but her story is eternal. Thank you so much for watching. My name is Lola Tarantula. If you haven't already done so, please leave a like on the video and subscribe to the channel. Now I will turn this question back to you. Let me know in the comments, who do you think put Bella in the witch elm?